I had a guy a few years ago, it was quite a few years ago now, probably seven or eight, um, who came up to me uh, here, and he'd been a part of Church in the Hill, and he was upset a little bit, and he said, you know, you guys put too much emphasis on community. Those are almost his exact words. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, I, he said, you just talk about it more than anything else. He said, it's just, it's overemphasized. You know, I, he said, you talk about community more than you talk about Jesus. And then when people say that to me, I want to listen and try to hear what's maybe behind those words. And as he unpacked that, that's really what he felt. And I, I reflected on that later. And I thought, you know, we're talking about two things that are almost inseparable, two sides of a same coin, if you will. That when you talk about Jesus, I think you can't extract community from it. I think a lot of that comes from living in a Jesus is my personal savior North American culture. You know that phrase, Jesus is my personal savior, was invented by a North American, for the most part, a Westerner. And I think it's a reflection of our individualistic culture to some degree. Now I get what that means, but Jesus is our savior, Right? Jesus is all of our Savior. Jesus died for all of mankind, not just for me. And he died to bring us into community. And so that's kind of what we're going to unpack. In fact, if you look in the beginning of the Bible, you find that before we were around, God was around, obviously, and he was in community with himself. God said in Genesis 2, let us make man in our image. So let's jump in. Genesis 2, 15 through 18. The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And you see, that's purpose. He gave the man purpose. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. And you notice he already had relationship with God here. He already had that relationship, and the Lord is saying, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Isn't that interesting that um, Adam is surrounded by all of God's creation. He has all the freedom in the world. He's autonomous. He has uh, power and authority. He's been given dominion to rule over the earth. But God himself says, I'm not done. It's not good that he is alone. It's interesting to me. (laughs) I want to be careful. I'm leaving, so I'll just see who I can offend before I leave. (laughs) But if you go to other countries, it, this, I'm just going to, if you go to other nations, for the most part, they treat dogs like dogs and cats like cats. But you come to North America and you find people treat dogs like their kids. They even talk about them like they're their kids. Some of you are nodding your head, right? And others of you are like, don't go there. <laughs> Now, if you love your, I, I don't, I love dogs. I'm not crazy about cats. So that's another conversation. But, uh, but, um, but if you love your pets, that's fine. But listen, they are not your kids. It's not enough. Adam had all the relationship in the world with all these animals that he, in fact, had named. Adam was kind of like in charge. Like, I'm, you're going to be what I call you. You're a giraffe. You're an orangutan. You're a, you're. So Adam had a, a measure of authority, but God said, I'm sorry, even though you have all that, Adam, that's still not enough. Even though you have dominion and a job and you have an identity in that job, that's not enough. You've got to be with somebody. And I want to point out here, this is before the fall. Right. Adam needing someone else, it not being good that he was alone, that was before the fall. And our need for other people is not because we're not enough and not because of sin in our lives. It's a part of how we were created. And it's a part of how God exists. Like Bruce was saying, God exists in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he's existed that way from the beginning of time. And when he created, it was let us make man in our image. God existed in community. And it's not for good for us to be alone. Now, aloneness, we're going to talk, produces all kinds of things. Now, I'm not talking about times where we need to be alone or times of reflection or solitude to recharge. That that is not what we're describing. What we're talking about is doing life alone. The theme for our life groups is? 
Oh, shoot. I wrote it. Uh, following Jesus together. <laughs> you guys, I spent so much time on working on this. I thought you were pulling my leg there for a second. We, so... I so just didn't know you were going there yet. It's, it's this idea that in a community of believers, the thing we have in common is we're following Jesus together. If you look on our website, you'll see that the byline of our church is called a resurrection community. We picked that on purpose. We didn't find that out there somewhere on the internet. We picked that on purpose because it's a reflection of something we're after. Because what we know is that in our humanity, in our humanness, we tend to go it alone In our fallen nature, we want to embrace, we love autonomy, and that's celebrated in our culture, autonomy. But I want to tell you that the best of us can get in trouble alone. Have you ever made a decision alone that you kind of thought later, oh, I sure wish I would have asked somebody about that. Yeah, we laugh because we know how dangerous it is. Have you ever heard the words of your father or some other authority figure echoing in your ears? Remember we talked about that, son? but you chose to go it alone and regretted the decision. So it's, it's almost like God is just, he's after something that he knows. He's after a remedy for something he knows about us. This is so dangerous that I wanted to, we want to look at a story in the, in the New Testament here with Jesus. And Jesus has been together with 12 men for three and a half years. Mm-hmm. They've been on a three and a half year camping trip. You think about it, 2,000 years ago in the Middle East, Jesus traveled with these guys. They didn't stay in, you know, Motel 6s or they didn't have, you know, our Airbnbs. They hung out together. They played together. They worked together. They learned together. And after three and a half years, they come to the, what they don't know is the end, but Jesus knows. And there's this thing called the Last Supper. And Luke would record these words in chapter 22. When the hour came, oh, go ahead. You got it, you're good. Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said, you know, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. Now it's a feast and so there's already a reason to be together besides the time, but Jesus knew this was going to be different than all the others. I love that little line at the beginning, just, the, just that first part. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. On Wednesday night in my life group, we had a really like low crew, and I didn't realize, but one of them pointed out, like they were kind of laughing at me because I was at the end just like sprawled out, <laughs> like I'm leading this group, but I'm sprawled out on the couch with my feet up, and because the, this is my community, and I'm so comfortable with them, I didn't even realize I'm just sprawled out on the couch. We had this conversation a little bit about that, and like that's the level of relationship they have. There's not this pretense, you're like, you're reclined you're relaxed, this is like your family. But Jesus breaks some news to them that is is new news. In fact, it's so new they can't wrap their heads around it. He says, you know, I'm not going to do this again until it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And if I was you, if I was Peter or James or John or Barnabas, I'd be kind of like, what does that mean? Because we've done this a lot together. Eating is, is very, eating together, sharing food and a meal together is very common in this culture. And after taking the cup, he gives thanks and says, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and in the same way gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body now. So every time you do this from now on in, do this in remembrance of me. Again, if you could just take a moment and just project yourself into that scene of being with Jesus for three and a half years, having access to him 24-7, being able to ask questions, have discussion, pick his brain. And all of a sudden he says things that sound like, is he going somewhere? Is this over? And in Jesus' mind, yeah, in some ways what they had was over. And then he drops the bombshell, he says in verse 21, you know, the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. What? What? you imagine the disciples, the buzz that must have created? Wait, 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 what did he just say? Did he say someone's going to betray him, one of us? Who would that be? Oh, his hand is at the table. The son of man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. And they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. What's happened to Judas? Somewhere along the line, Judas has lost his heart. And he's kept up the facade of being in the community, and he's a liar, and he's a thief, 
and he's a traitor, but he's kept up the facade. And the way he's been able to keep up that facade is he's kept it to himself. You can imagine a year before when this entered in, this idea into Judas, if he turned and asked his friends, hey, I'm thinking of betraying Jesus. What do you think about that? Can you imagine the reaction he would have had? Hey, I'm wondering, I don't think this Jesus character is all he's cracked up to be. I think we should sell him out. What do you think would have happened with the other 11? They would have confronted him. His foolishness would have been exposed. And if he would have listened, his life would have been saved. Now, I know that's all in the natural. But I'm just saying that this guy did what he did because he chose to go it alone. And look how they responded next. A dispute also arose among them as to which of which of them was considered the greatest. So they look at this, this bombshell has just been dropped by Jesus, one of you will betray me. And then instantly, they're focused on who's the best, who's the greatest. Can you imagine Jesus's, like what it would be like for Jesus in that moment? Like, oh, I've given so much to you guys and here you are arguing, like you, you don't get it. You're arguing over who's the best. Mm. You know, um, the fruit over the years as I've watched people, I've watched it almost like a fork in the road, people who have chosen to deliberately embrace doing life together in community with Jesus and others are people that inevitably grow. They have a place of refuge in, to- in times that are tough. They mature different than other people. They... they Their hearts are enlarged rather than shrunk, kind of like what Wes was saying, because they learn to give. They learn to serve others. It's almost like describing a mature child who's moving into young adulthood and adulthood. They have learned what it is to live and work and function in a family. On the other hand, people that have withdrawn from that, people that have resisted that, I think stay perpetually immature, and they're in trouble all the time. It may go in cycles and circles, but it just all, they're perpetually struggling. They're perpetually immature. They never go deeper. And in the moment, individualism, being alone, I can do this by myself, it, it has its appeal and it, it looks good from the outside. And we kind of, we celebrate that in our culture to be able to be a self-made man or woman, to be able to do things by yourself, to not have to be dependent, like that is seen as strength. But when someone continues down that road, it leads to some really dark things. Because if you don't have someone, someone else you're walking alongside with, someone who actually sees you for who you are, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you're missing that mirror, that piece of seeing who you are and where you're at. You end up unaware of the path that you're going down, and it leads to like twisted doctrine. You, your, I, your concept of truth gets warped because you don't have any other input. It's just whatever you believe. You start making bad decisions. You, you don't grow up. You stay immature. Lack of social skills, lack of foundation, and you're ultimately alone. And not to mention the fact that we lose because we don't have what you have to offer. We don't receive what you bring to the table, what you bring into the community. Everybody loses. You know, loneliness is epidemic in our culture today. Isn't it crazy? We're the most socially connected generation in all of history. As far as I have 1,500 people that follow me on Facebook, that are even my friends on Facebook. And yet we are the loneliest generation in all of history. I mean, statistically, even psychologists have warned us of the dangers of loneliness, of being alone. Yeah, the Journal of Perspectives on Psychological Science published a a study. They did a meta-analysis of 70 different studies involving over 3 million people. And the results show a direct correlation between loneliness and mortality rate. Dr. Dale Archer says that loneliness is now a major public health issue and represents a greater health risk than obesity and is as destructive to your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Yeah, so quit smoking and join the church, man. There's a, it's a, just in a, in a nutshell, that's what we're saying here this morning. <laughs> 
Listen, there's a lady, uh, an Australian nurse by the name of Bonnie Ware, and she wrote a book, a fascinating book. It's called The Five Regrets of the Dying, The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And, and um, I'm not sure, I, I kind of think she's a believer, but it wasn't written as a Christian book. But one of the things that she lists in the top five is this idea of neglecting my friendships, neglecting my relationships, going it alone. And here's what she says. I read it this, this past week. I pulled the book down and kind of re- reread part of it again. But she says, loneliness isn't a lack of people. It's a lack of understanding and acceptance. Huge amounts of people the world over have experienced loneliness in a crowded room. In fact, being alone in a crowded room often highlights and exacerbates loneliness. It doesn't matter how many people are around you. If there is no one available who understands you or accepts you as you are, loneliness can very easily present its agonizing self. It's very different than being alone, as I have often loved this in the past. Being alone can mean you could be lonely or you could be happy. But loneliness is a longing for the company of someone who understands you. Isn't that an awesome thing to think about? Loneliness is this longing to be in the company. Who would understand me? I want to tell you, no one knows you better than God. He knows inside and out. And the amazing thing is, the people of God, the reason we come together primarily is to know and to be known. It's a, it's a two-way street. If I resist that, I can be in a crowd of people, even believers, and still be lonely. That, that piece of being able to be known is so huge. We talked earlier about how we celebrate being individual or being able to accomplish things on our own, and it's seen as a strength. But the true strength lies in being willing to enter into community, mm-hmm. in being able to be vulnerable and be seen for who you are. Because that's scary. Because being seen for who you are means showing the ugly sides of yourself. Being seen for who you are means being open to being hurt. Being seen for who you are in in a broken community because we have sin in our lives and community has, has been tainted by that means you will get hurt and you will hurt others. But stepping into that means recognizing how much greater God is Mm -hmm. than our ability to be hurt or to hurt others. It takes a huge level of courage, a huge level of strength, and an immense amount of maturity to be able to step into this kind of community that Jesus has called us to. I want to say that reflection is this community Reflection, uh, this, this community is a reflection of something God started. Listen to the words of Paul in Colossians. He says, he, listen, he is before all things, and in all things, everything is held together. In him, all things are held together. I used to think, I, I used to hear sermons years ago that that was some reference to chemistry, you know, that God holds the atom together and God holds the universe together, which I think would include that. But Paul's not talking about chemis- chemicals or chemistry or physics, He's talking about relationships. Because listen, and he is the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so then everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have in him, in Christ, all the fullness dwell. And now through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether the things are in heaven or things are on earth, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Follow the train of thought that Paul is saying here. Paul is saying that this Christ figure, this this Jesus, resurrected from the dead, conquered sin, and by doing so, brought us back together with the Father. Because sin was what blocked us. And then he says, and that's what brings us together. That same resurrection power allows us to be together without biting and devouring one another. It doesn't mean, like Nicole saying, that we don't see some of the ugly, but the ugly doesn't kill us anymore. It doesn't destroy us anymore. In fact, it bonds us because we realize, I thought I was the only one who struggled with this. And you get into a life group and you realize, wow, 
We have more in common than I thought. You too? You too? Yeah, me too. In fact, Paul would kind of take this one thought further in, second, in 1 Corinthians. He would say this, 2 Corinthians 5, he says, you know, from now on, now that we're part of this, we don't regard anyone from a worldly point of view. In other words, I knew how to do you and I knew how to do this outside of the kingdom. I knew how to do relationships. How did that work out for you? Well, I sort of tended to use people or I got used. And Paul says, no more. It's a new, it's a new day. We once regarded Christ in that way. I just, I kind of watched Christ. Jesus was my errand boy. Jesus was my, my homeboy. He kind of, I, I ran to him when I needed him. I used him. Paul says, no more. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Man, that old man, that old woman is gone and the new is here. And all this is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he's given all of us the ministry of reconciliation. He's committed to us, he says, the message of reconciliation. Listen, this is the engine that drives everything we do, that we're called to be people who reconcile. Grandma Pat uses the gift that she's been given to love people, to be a bridge between that back door and this community of people. Think about the potential of that if we were to wrap our minds around Man, I am a minister. I'd like to deputize you if I could. I'll get you all a little silver badge. Minister of reconciliation. And wear that proudly. So what does it look like to step into this? I want to recognize here that as we're talking about this, there's probably someone in the seat who feels like, I've tried. Mm -hmm but it hasn't worked. Or I've tried to get, even tried to get connected at Church on the Hill and I've reached out and I'm still alone. And my heart breaks for that. I, in pastoring life groups, that's my heart. I want to see people be able to get small so that they can go big with God together. But I've had a lot of conversations with people who are like, I want to get connected, but there's not a group that... I can connect to because of time or because of availability of leaders, all these things, or I've been hurt. And so I just want to speak to you and say, I'm sorry for the hurt that you've experienced. I've been hurt too. And it's hard to step into it and it's hard to step in again when you've been hurt. But that's the invitation and what we're called to do here is to change our mindset a little bit. Because it's easy to come in and say, I need to do this because I've got to get these things out of it. Like, what's in it for me? But what Jesus is calling us to is to imitate him. And that, that's hard. In John 15, he says, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. You ever had, heard anybody say, yeah, I tried that church thing. It didn't work out for me. How many have ever heard those words? I tried church. Didn't, didn't work for me. Think about what's being said there. You know, when Jesus had that conversation of that Luke 22 passage when they were around the table and one of them is going to betray him, the other 11 are arguing who's going to be the greatest on the night that you're about to be betrayed. Did you ever, th were, if you were Jesus, wouldn't you like be just tempted to just quit and just get, um, you're done, you're all fired. All of you are fired. I don't know why I, I ever picked leave. you in the first place. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pick 11 new ones, 12 new ones. I mean, have you ever, can you imagine the exasperation and the, just the sense of, ah, oh, what have we been talking about for three and a half years here? I don't know about you, but I would have been tempted to quit on them. But Jesus hung in there with them. 
Why is that? Because he knew something, right? He was after something bigger. Listen, if, 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 if you're not interested in humility and leaving a sinful life behind, you will never fit in community. It will never work for you. And I want to suggest to you that it's not community's fault. You see, because the whole idea of this resurrection community is that we've come in with this idea that Jesus died not to create community, but to save us from sin. Follow me what I'm saying here. This is the heart of it. Jesus died not to create community. Community is the byproduct. What he died for was to save us from our sin because that's what's killing us, folks. That's what hurts us. That's what separates us. That's what creates all this friction. That's why we quit on church. Because we can't deal with our own sin or I can't stand yours. Right? But when Jesus dealt with sin on the cross, what happened is is it lowered this barrier. It took away the poison. And it disarmed that power. And all of a sudden we find, we come back together. Man, in a marriage, if you're at odds with your mate, If you just can't seem to bring some resolve, I'm telling you, there's your opinion and her opinion, and then there's the opinion you need to look for, which is God's opinion. (laughs) You're going to find the answer somewhere in there. What is God calling you to do in regards to sin? Because that's what divides us. And we can't do it on our own. I got the opportunity a couple of months ago to share at elementary chapel and was trying to talk about sin and like how do you teach a bunch of elementary school kids who don't want to sit still about sin and so I was like I need them to I need something that looks visually like something interesting so I brought a bunch of boxes into the room Um, I've had a garage full of boxes so that was great cleaned out my garage and taught chapel in one go but we just asked about, like, what, what does sin do? And listed different sins. And as we were talking about it, I built up this wall in front of myself. Because our sin, our sin separates us from God, but our sin also separates us from each other. Mm. And if we're going to, going to enter into community, we have to deal with our sin. Because that wall's there, and it's, we can't just ignore it. It's, div- it's separating us from God and from each other. And that's where Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, but I call you my friends. J.C. Ryle writes, this world is full of sorrow because it's full of sin. He says, it's a dark place, it's a lonely place, and it's a disappointing place. But the brightest sunbeam is found and it is a friend. Friendship halves our sorrows and doubles our joys. Friendship, listen, listen, we live in a broken world and we can't, we, we, I don't know if there's any escape. I don't think so. But what he's saying is, is this community, this relationship will half your sorrow and double your joy because you don't have to do it. You don't have to go it alone. As we finish with communion this morning, I'd like you to approach the elements as we do, as our custom on Sunday morning, with this idea that what you're going to pick up, this cup and this bread, is something that's, that, that Jesus did to bring us together, not just, not just he and I, but us, to bring us together. I'd like you to ask yourself as you come, am I in this together with the person I'm sitting next to and the people that are in front and behind me? Or is this just my personal savior thing? I'd like you to ask the Lord, just reflecting on Wes's words this morning. Man, have I come as a giver or do I come as a consumer? I don't say that this morning to make you feel bad. I just say that to say there's a better offer on the table. There's something that God offers you, which is fellowship with him and communion with the others. It's interesting that we call this time communion because we don't do it alone in a closet. We do it together. So as you pick up the elements this morning, um, we'll wait till everyone has them and then we'll, we'll take together.